So I've been asked to uh, tell you how to avoid complication in Blount's disease, and the best way to do it is to not do osteotomies. No, it's a recurring theme. <laughs> anyway, Dr. Blount is given credit for describing what he called tibia vera. He did not attach his name. He didn't call it Blount's disease. I don't think naming rights were popular in the 30s, but he was presaged by Dr. Ehrlicher in Germany, who had a, a small series as well. In either case, the only treatment recommended for decades was corrective osteotomy, this particular one is a bit undercorrected if you measure the angles, and they apparently didn't cut the fibula, thus illustrating some of the challenges, and it looks like there's a fysial bar, but this was years ago. And uh, we do know that the natural history of Blount's disease is not benign, so this patient went on to this deformity because no treatment was undertaken in the meantime. Wistfully, had they had guided growth here, I don't think you'd be showing that x-ray, and probably no osteotomy would have been required. Early intervention is recommended, no matter how you treat it, preferably by the age of four. If you correct the alignment by the age of four, it may not reoccur, which makes me wonder if it's really a disease, or is it simply mechanical overloading, or vitamin D deficiency, or other things. But uh, Nevertheless, uh, the most popular treatment still in the U.S., if not the gold standard, is the Rab osteotomy. George Rab is a, a brilliant uh, mathematician, good surgeon, and he figured he wasn't the first to describe oblique osteotomies. I believe Schantz was. But in the upper tibia, and you have to cut the fibula that the artist didn't show, it's really two osteotomies below the tibial tubercle, hence oblique, and by being oblique, as you shift out of varus, you can correct rotation, depending on how steep you place the osteotomy. Fixation is challenging. You use a single screw and you don't tighten it, which is counterintuitive in orthopedics. And then you rely on uh, wedging the cast in often obese children with ligamentous laxity. So it's not a very gratifying thing to do, but it's still very popular. I also would worry that in elevating the periosteum to do this, you may create tethering or aggravate tethering or cause a bony bridge because recurrent deformity is quite common. So in my practice, I never did do bracing. I've eliminated osteotomy in most cases in favor of guided growth. The complications are fewer and easier to manage. It's virtually percutaneous, a small incision. Arthrogram is optional. You can see the plateaus here which is good for confidently putting your guide pin right in the center. The screw will hold in the cartilage as well as the bone. Nowadays, I perhaps would use a little longer screw, as I mentioned earlier. Nevertheless, it works well. Uh, Dr. Birch, in a review article in the Academy Journal, uh, made this comment, response to growth modulation is neither predictable nor absolute. And I would offer the same descriptor for osteotomies or anything we do. He, however, also stated growth modulation should not be expected to correct internal tibial torsion, and I disagree with that. My observation is whether it's Blount's, Ricketts, Varus of any cause, the torsional inward deformity of the tibia occurs through the physis. It may well correct through the physis given a chance. So what I tell the families is not that torsion will necessarily correct but that if it doesn't correct, when I remove hardware, I can do a supramalleolar osteotomy, and I never have to. The considerations are that guided growth, preferably by the age, over the age of two, but the earlier the better before adolescence. Same day surgery, ignore the fibula, immediate weight bearing, much less costly parental acceptance. So it has every advantage to offer with almost no complications except the occasional fractured screw, which I haven't experienced, but I, have, I will comment on extensively. Now, in Cozen's deformity, there were no takers earlier for osteotomy because we know recurrent deformity is, a, is inherently, is almost the rule, along with these other complications. So I question the logic of, of Valgus producing osteotomy, you're at the same level with the same structures at risk and the risk of recurrence for Blount's disease. So why do we accept this kind of a treatment in Blount's where we don't in Cozen's? I think they both have drawbacks. 
if you, under, if you feel or rule in a bony bridge, you have the option of still using guided growth but resect the bony bridge. If you do an MRI and you find a fibrocartilaginous structure, you don't need to do anything on the medial side. Simply overpower it with a titanium tether on the lateral side. So this is the crux of the problem. Those who aren't fans of guided growth in blouts feel that the hardware should be stainless steel, larger implants, solid screws, quad plates, stacked plates. However, this is all conjecture. The evidence is lacking that any of these are necessary or helpful. So on the cover of JPO is this case of a girl who has a broken screw with somewhat of a condemnation of using this technique, but if you look twice, there's exposed screw and it breaks not where the head and the shank meet, but where the screw enters the tibia. That is a technical error that should be avoided when possible. So if you're aware of it, and with the fluoroscope you should be, there are measures you can take to get better contact and then countersink the screw so the shank is not exposed. This is a, a recon plates and solid screws. They can correct the deformity, but even solid stainless steel screws will break if you load them. Screws are not made for three-point bending. They're made for pull-out. So this is a, a problem. And as they enter the cortex, it's always the metaphyseal screw that breaks, not the epiphyseal, because of the exposed fragment. This was nicely shown by Dr. Kennis in his laboratory of the mechanics of the problem that ideally you want a flexible extraperiosteal construct where the fulcrum of correction is somewhere in hyperspace and moves toward the leg as these diverge. But in fact, if you have an exposed screw, then you no longer have a flexible tension band. You have the equivalent of a rigid staple that is subject to breaking. So avoid that as best possible. The leverage has changed and the hardware will fail. So what I do, I only use a single plate. I increase the bend in the plate if I need to, to get better bony contact. And then after removing the guide pins, you countersink the screws. You tighten them alternately like lug nuts, tighten top and bottom. And you'll often see the plate wrap around the bone. I prefer titanium, but it's your choice. If you feel compelled to use solid screws, a second plate or four hole, that's your choice. Here's a patient I did recently. Um, I was suspicious of blounts, but she was only a year and a half old. There's no hurry. I said, I'll see you in six months. And indeed, she was worsening. It's obviously not physiologic now on this side. The physiologic varus corrected. This got worse. So I interceded with guided growth. Unfortunately, they didn't come back for 16 months. It's true when you do minimal surgery, sometimes in spite of telling the family, they, they forget to come back. So she did come back overcorrected. I didn't have the heart to remove this and put it on this side with this appearance. So I simply took it out. And uh, here's the orthogram upon removal. This is optional, but interesting to see what's going on or not going on over here. And I removed the plate, as you see here. And uh, I think they'll be more compliant in the follow-up. I expect she'll come back to neutral. She might reoccur, and I can do guided growth again. This patient is uh, three years old with unilateral blouts, and he wasn't correcting very much after eight months. I questioned whether I should put in a femoral plate to speed up the process, but I held steady. 18 months after insertion, he's at neutral. And uh, it's interesting, as is typical, the thrust and the lateral laxity resolved, the torsion resolved without direct treatment, and the limb lengths were closer to equal. At that point in my practice, I was taking out the entire hardware, which, again, is not wrong. It's a surgeon's choice. So he started as infantile blounts, and then over time, he gradually had recurrent varus. So now he's juvenile blounts. I don't think the the classification is at all helpful if it doesn't change the choice of treatment. Treated with a new eight plate, corrected by age 10, took out the screw. Um, he re gradually reoccurred, so now he's adolescent blounts. Screw was put back in and taken out, and the process can be continued. So guided growth can be definitive, although it may need to be repeated.
Here's a patient who my colleague had done guided growth on the right side and osteotomy because the left seemed too severe in her judgment. And as it can be the case, this was undercorrected and reoccurred. So the osteotomy was salvaged by guided growth, which begs the question, what's the purpose of the osteotomy? This patient had variable correction rate. This was more severe involvement on her left side. It took two and a half years to get correction on the right side, and uh, whereupon I removed hardware, and it took an additional year to correct on the left side. When you are restraining for angular correction, there is no time limit. It may take four years in achondroplasia. Again, the thrust resolved, the torsion resolved, and did not require osteotomies. This patient had rab osteotomy at age four, and then at age eight presented with bilateral varus, and uh, he had guided growth, failed to come back in a timely manner for follow-up, overcorrected. There's the osteotomy scar from his four-year-old surgery. So I felt this was too much correction, overcorrection, to just remove the plates and hope it would respond. So I put the plates immediately, as you see here, and he corrected and uh, continues to do well without further surgery. This patient, uh, timing is everything. I saw him at age 13. It doesn't work as predictably in adolescent flounce, but it's worth trying. You can see the physis and no bridge. But they became frightened and went away for two years, and now it's too late. This is a single limb x-ray because he's too wide for the cassette. So guided growth, of course, would not work here, and you have to resort to other technology. In his case, a Taylor spatial frame Despite my best efforts, not quite fully corrected, but it did heal promptly. And uh, this is expensive technology that should be reserved for salvage cases. This is an old price. It's probably you know, a few thousand dollars more in the U.S. to accomplish what you can do with an eight plate in many cases. Therefore, the value of guided growth is superior because the cost is less than osteotomies. So in conclusion, in my practice, it's the treatment of choice for any patient with blounts, even after 13, if you want to give it a try. The torsion laxity and limb length all improve secondarily in most cases. It's very cost effective. Repeat as necessary, follow to maturity. Osteotomy is relegated to a salvage procedure. And that's how you minimize the complications, maybe not avoid. Gracias.